want to try and look at what we're doing in a bit more of a historical perspective. We have secured amazing advances. Who would have thought six years ago in Hyde Park that anyone could have said the next president of the United States would have voted against this war? But it happened. Who could have imagined that American opinion and British opinion could be shifted as strongly as it did? But it happened. But having said that, we know ourselves that we have not won this argument at the government level, either in the United States or in Britain. All the parties uh, in this country and in America accept that there is a war on terror, that it's got to be tackled, that the issues involved are human rights and all that sort of stuff. Our soldiers are in NATO, in Kabul. I didn't know my geography is not very good, the North Atlantic stretch to <laughs> Afghanistan. And the question we have to ask is how are we going to win this argument completely? And I want just to touch on the various issues that we are bringing together and must bring together more strongly. Um, it's very common to talk about a movement like ours as a single issue group. You know, some people are involved in party politics and some prefer single issues. The point I want to make is this is not a single issue at all. It is a very, very broad issue, like most single issues were presented in that way. I mean, the anti-apartheid movement was a single issue group, the Tolpado Martyrs was a single issue group, the Chartists and the Suffragettes, but we know from experience that when a single issue is raised, it touches on many other issues as well. And I think the first thing to say, and it's just worth saying, is that the war in Iraq and Afghanistan is actually one of the oldest wars you can imagine. It is an imperialist war where powerful countries invade other countries in order to steal their resources. And that's not new, the British Empire was based on that. I think, that. I think that's worth saying because, first of all, it's true, but also it sets what we're engaged in against the proper historical perspective. And it is an imperial war against the United Nations Charter, which was published when I was a young man coming home from the war, which said that we would, this generation would uh, uh, save future generations from the scourge of war. Second thing it has to be said, and this may uh, be more, uh, 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 well, more of interest to the police, but if you are invaded, you have a right of self-defense. Mm. And this idea that people in Iraq and Afghanistan who are resisting the invasion are militant Muslim extremists is a complete bloody lie. If there is a new one, well, let me make a uh, I joined Gad's army when I was 16, and if the Germans had arrived, I tell you, I could use a bayonet, a rifle, a revolver, and if I'd seen a German officer having a meal, I'd have tossed a grenade through the window. Would I have been a freedom fighter or a terrorist? And the right of self-defense is a right that has to be established. The other thing, of course, uh, is that, uh, talking about imperialism, America is an empire in decline. I know that because I lived in one all my life. <laughs> I know the characteristics of declining empires. They're a bit more dangerous when they're declining. I mean, 50 years ago, we had the Suez operation. That was the last attempt by Anthony Eden to reassert the British Empire in the Middle East. And a, a declining empire, like a wounded tiger, could be very, very dangerous. But don't make any mistake, if we are having a, we're having a meeting a hundred years from now, uh, the Chinese and the Indian and other empires would have come up and we would see the American empire in its proper historical perspective. The next thing to say about it, and it's very, very important, and that is the misuse of religion to justify this war. Mr. Blair has found a new function as an agent for the Almighty, and he has launched a campaign for faith and world peace, and he identifies these militant Muslim extremists as people who've got to be dealt with. Well, put quite candidly, he is a militant Christian extremist who's using religion in order to justify the occupation of those countries. Uh, what he does with his faith is a matter for him, um, I'm not in favour of hanging Bush or Blair, but I would like to see a war crimes tribunal that identified the crime so he had to live with them till the day he died. Then it's also a question about torture. 
War is sanitized by the media, but to be quite candid, war is about killing people, it's about plunder, it's about rape, it's about torture, that's what war is. And it's a characteristic of all wars. And I'm glad Obama is publishing more information about the tortures in America because, truthfully, if that the sort of information that was published about, about Iraq in the old days, and I don't doubt there was a torture in Iraq, uh, people said, oh, of course, our values don't out allow us to do it, and they do allow us to do it, and we do do it. Then there's the question of civil liberties, as Andrew mentioned. I mean, the anti-terrorism legislation is being used now to repress popular demonstrations in Britain on political issues. Yeah. We've had the recent Tomlinson case. I was stopped the other day by a policewoman uh, and uh, a church down at the Prevention Tennis Act. I'm in the Walter Wolfgang category now. <laughs> she said, what's your name? I said, Tony Ben. She said, how do you spell it? I told her. She said, Tony Ben. <laughs> and uh, she searched my, my car for uh, bombs. And, uh, and so this civil liberties issue is an issue not necessarily connected with the war, but it is about the war that it happened. <laughs> then it is about the cost of the war. For God's sake, we're spending billions on nuclear weapons when they're going to be savage cuts in public expenditure in Britain to pay for the crisis. I'd rather put the money in schools and health and, uh, and employment than put it in the banks or put it in a trident or new super prisons we're going to build to deal with the people who are about to be arrested. And it's also about a real defence policy because Coming back to what I said earlier, if we are invaded, we should defend ourselves. I'm not, I'm afraid, in the category of a pure non-violent person. If a foreign enemy came, I would do what I could, not at my age, I'd be much use. And I think some of the military are thinking about this. I've been a couple of times to the Shrivenden Defence College, an extraordinary experience, with an admiral in the chair and colonels and so on. They wrote to me, Tony Ben care of the Stop the War Coalition. They didn't even know what I did. <laughs> and I went there expecting I was going to be chewed up. And I tell you, you'd be absolutely surprised if you'd heard the discussion. I said to them, how many of you here, there were 70 colonels, very senior people, how many of you here believe it was because we had the atomic bomb the Russians didn't invade? Only two out of 70 believed that. They all realise now that all future wars are going to be guerrilla wars. I, if we're invaded, we're going to have to do what is happening in Iraq, and they can't beat guerrilla movements elsewhere. So it's even defense, even serious defense analysts don't go along with this. And it's also about what sort of future. I, I've come to the conclusion there's a factor in life that's never been mentioned, the idealism of old age. I am an idealist. I mean, usually young people are idealists, and old people say, if you know what you knew, you wouldn't say it. But I'm an idealist. I look forward to the idea when there is a world government that is able to enforce peace and justice. I look forward to a United Nations based on the population of the world and not the number of weapons you have. And I think uh, we, we, we have a duty to put all these arguments more prominently into our campaign. We've got to be positive. People are very, very frightened. I'm very frightened, but I think if you frighten people, you have the negative effect. You've, we've got to show people, and I think we have, We've got to show people that in this massive crisis, we have constructive and important things to say that stretch right across the political spectrum. You know, there are conservatives who agree with us, liberals who agree with us. It isn't an ideological movement, this. It's a movement about an issue, peace, security, and justice. And if we go on saying that, I think when we look back on this movement 10 and 20 and 30 years uh, in the future, we'll look and see what a contribution we've been able to make. Now, you'll have to forgive me, I've got another meeting. <laughs> I've retired, so I only do two now a day, but I've got to go off to Didcot for a Civil Liberties Conference. Thank you very much for asking me. I'm deeply honoured to be the President of the World.